Good afternoon. Welcome to today's Coffee with Curiosity. This is a monthly uh, lecture series started over a year ago by ICTS and has become very popular and has been receiving very good response. We have been very lucky to hear lectures of many eminent scientists here. Today's speaker, Sir Michael Berry, is a special for us at JNP. He had visited us long back on Christmas day of 97. Sir, you had come to this very hall and gone around all the laboratories. Then our founder director, Professor Vishweshwara, I'm sure would have shared his plans of non-formal education programs. I'm very happy to mention here that all those plans have come, become operational and the programs are running very well. These programs cover a wide age group of students from primary school, high school, and colleges. We have a program called SEED, Science Education in Early Development, for primary school students, which takes place during summer vacation time. Then we have a program called SO, Science Over Weekends, for high school students. These run, run throughout the year. Then we have REAP, Research Education Advancement Program for undergraduate students. This is a three-year program which prepares the students for a career in science. Due to the hard work of the students and unstinted support of the faculty of various research institutes, this program has become very successful. More than 120 students who have gone through this program have gone to pursue PhD programs and many have become faculty in various research institutes, and some have come back to teach in REAP program. We at JNP are very happy that we have played a role in providing a platform for the teaching by scientists to interested students, coordinate this program, and providing some modest lab facility to students. Our science popularization program is also receiving a very good response. Back then when you visited, we were attracting about 185,000 visitors a year, and now we are attracting 300,000 visitors every year. Our other popular uh, popularization activities, like workshops, viewing of astronomical events are also attracting a lot of people. Earlier, we used to have public lectures by scientists occasionally, Thanks to the incredible, incredible effort of ICTS, through this lecture series, public are getting opportunity to listen to these talks by very distinguished scientists. I extend a very warm welcome to you, sir. I heartily welcome Professor Radham Narsimha and all the other distinguished audience. I request Professor Gopakumar to say a few words about ICTS. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Galgali. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today, uh, again with uh, this very special copy with curiosity uh, uh, event. Uh, uh, again, I don't want to belabor the, uh, my description of ICTS since many of you are regulars. Uh, but if you haven't uh, heard about ICTS, we, are, uh, 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 we don't do just the outreach activities. So it has been great to partner with the planetarium on this copy with Curiosity, which is held monthly. If this is your first time, uh, please uh, look up the ICTS webpage and you will see the calendar. Uh, and you can even see, uh, you sign up for uh, email notifications of the copy with Curiosity and other public lecture. So this is something which has been now running for one and a half years. And um, every month we've had, without a break, uh, uh, these uh, lectures. And uh, it's been always heartening to uh, see the turnout. Uh, uh, so uh, ICTS, of course, ha has more than outreach. We also are a research center. We have programs on uh, a number of research topics in theoretical physics, mathematics, 
uh, and computer science, quantitative biology, etc. Uh, uh, in fact, Professor Berry is here for a program on non-Hermitian physics, and he will also be giving a slightly more technical at a um, uh, a, a slightly more technical lectures uh, starting tomorrow at the ICTS campus. These will be the Chandrasekhar lectures of the ICTS, uh, and it's on nature's optics and um, uh, many diverse uh, phenomena there. Uh, so, uh, so if you're interested, I invite you to come to the campus. It's at 4 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, uh, so uh, it's also my task to introduce the speaker to you. Uh, it's a great privilege to be introducing an extremely distinguished scientist like uh, uh, Sir Michael Berry. Uh, he's currently the uh, Melville Wills Professor of Physics Emeritus at, uh, uh, at the University of Bristol. Uh, I, I will not, this, since this is not a scientific, uh, um, inter I don't want to go into the details of his incredible contributions, but I, I, since it's for the general public, I just wanted to say that uh, Professor Berry is very, very unusual uh, in these days of specialization in science, uh, in that uh, he has explored many areas of physics, uh, and more broadly, uh, I would say, uh, and, uh, and what is even more remarkable is that he has consistently uh, uncovered various gems uh, which have been overlooked in many cases for decades or even centuries. Uh, and um, a lot of his insights have been inspired by observations of uh, phenomena around us. And I would urge you to look at his webpage uh, in which um, uh, there are a number of uh, events uh, ranging from tsunamis uh, to uh, uh, spinning tops or uh, uh, and the patterns at the bottom of a swimming pool. Uh, you can uh, and uh, uh, Professor Berry has uh, ha has uncovered um, or, or so, uh, sort of seen deeper into them than uh, uh, the, their surface, so to say. Uh, and um, uh, in fact, uh, I think he says on his website that one of uh, one of the things he enjoys is uh, is uh, uncovering uh, down to earth or dramatic uh, and beautiful. Uh, 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 beautiful examples of um, uh, from uh, of mathematical beauty uh, from um, uh, uh, from um, uh, uh, in day to day in many day to day uh, 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 phenomena, uh, as he says, uh, finding the arcane in the mundane. Uh, so this, I think, has a lesson for scientists and non-scientists. So we often tend to overlook the so to say commonplace. Uh, and uh, uh, but it's uh, uh, but, but it has been uh, such a rich source of uh, 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 a, a, a rich source of um, uh, knowledge and understanding. Uh, the, and um, uh, I also wanted to say that uh, it's not just from uh, uh, from the everyday, but uh, Professor Berry's work has had an immense impact in our understanding of some of the fundamental theories uh, from our understanding of quantum mechanics, his work on the Berry phase and the connection is all pervading in the sense that it permeates many areas now of, uh, of physics. Uh, similarly, his influential work on quantum chaos and its connections to number theory, uh, et cetera. So, it's, um, so don't get just uh, uh, fooled by thinking that uh, Professor Berry is, uh, uh, is, um, is, um, uh, is very narrowed in terms of his, uh, his uh, interests uh, from, uh, in optics and so on. Uh, but um, uh, so I urge you to visit his webpage. And uh, uh, one of the very nice things is that all his papers are available there, so you don't have to uh, you don't have to face the paywalls of journals and so on to access uh, his papers. And uh, many of them are expository and, and uh, wonderful to read. So I would uh, urge the younger people to, uh, 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 to, to take a look at his webpage. Um, 
I, I should also say, as is customary on these occasions, that uh, Professor Berry is the recipient of numerous prestigious awards and recognition which, uh, uh, f uh, which have followed from his remarkable discoveries. Uh, I'll just mention a few, uh, the Fellowship of the Royal Society and, uh, and the Royal Medal from them, the Dirac Medal of the ICTP, the Lorenz Medal, the Wolf Prize, and so on. It's a very long list, and I will not uh, take up more time uh, listing all of them. Uh, so, uh, so it's uh, it's great to have him give the uh, give this copy with curiosity, as well as the Chandrasekhar lectures. He's a frequent visitor to Bangalore, so I hope he'll come again uh, to ICTS and the numerous institutions here. Uh, so, with that, let me welcome him. And uh, uh, and there's a small uh, little ceremony before that. I I would uh, invite Professor Rodham Narsimha to hand over on behalf of ICTS a memento to uh, Professor Berry. Uh. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, after that, what can I say? I can quote a colleague of mine. You've heard the hype, now you get the lope. Okay. It's with enormous pleasure that I'm here today. I love coming to India. It's one of my favorite countries I visit very often. And my favorite city in uh, India is this city of boiled beans, this uh, uh, Bangalore. I've been many times. The last time was actually some years ago. But uh, I've also been here... And as was mentioned, on Christmas Day, 1997, I had the enormous pleasure of meeting the late Professor Vishweshwa and his family, and Mrs. Vishweshwa is here today. It's really something I very much appreciate that you took the trouble to come. My family and I had dinner with you on Christmas Day. This was memorable. The... Uh, underlying theme of this talk today, which is not mostly about my research, there will be some near the end, is connections. Now, in its generality, the notion that things are connected is very familiar, but it's less familiar when you dig into details, as I'm going to do. And connections have been emphasized many times, and in his retirement speech, my very distinguished colleague, Sir Charles Frank, who was, by the way, a Raman professor here uh, uh, at one time, uh, he said, um, wh where are we? Uh, physics is not just concerning the nature of things, but concerning the interconnectedness of all the natures of things. My connections are going to be uh, 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 ones that link physics with other physics, but also with matters outside physics in the wider culture. And to start, let's um, think about the compact disc player. Some of you may remember compact disc players as way of, uh, ways of reproducing uh, music. This was invented in 1982, and what is it? It's a four-mile spiral of music, uh, uh, encoding music from the uh, uh, inside outwards as a series of bumps and pits you know, with dimensions of nanometers in one direction and microns uh, in, in the other. And uh, you surely know the sound is sampled as a series of uh, zeros and uh, ones. And this shows about a thousandth of a second's worth. Uh, uh, it's sampled 44,000 times a second. Now, at the heart of this uh, device is a laser. And uh, that was invented in 1958. And this scans the surface and reflects the, uh, uh, the bumps and pits as the disc turns. And uh, this signal, on and off, is converted into electricity and then back into sound. And uh, here's the laser and here is the conversion back into sound. Now, underlying the laser itself is a central principle of physics discovered in 1917 by Einstein during the decade of bewilderment and struggle that eventually led to quantum mechanics. Now, there were very puzzling experiments concerning matter and light. And uh, Einstein was thinking about how the two are related, matter and light. 
Well, what came to him in 1917 was an insight that still seemed miraculous. This was groping towards the full quantum theory, which was developed by other people. The idea was that these ideas of light and matter, which were current at that time, could be consistent only if there were three processes by which atoms can absorb and emit light. One of them is that an atom can absorb light by transferring its electrons to a higher energy state. The light shines on the atom, the electron moves to a higher energy level. Um, excitation, no surprise there. Once excited, an atom can uh, emit light by spontaneously and randomly decaying back to the level or to some other one. Um, Einstein recognized the need for this randomness. He didn't like it, but he recognized the need for it. Um, we're stuck with it even today. This was spontaneous emission. It was the second process. But his true originality was to argue that uh, uh, something else is necessary. An atom can also emit light uh, in a way that depends on the light that shines on it already. And that's stimulated emission. It led directly to the laser, uh, and uh, it, it works like this. Uh, you have, um, here we are, let me see. Yes, you, you have uh, uh, some light coming along, and here's an atom, and uh, this atom is electron is excited to a higher energy level. This light stimulates this uh, uh, electron to uh, uh, make a transition to the lower state, emitting more light, so you get two. This process continues and you get this coherent cascade and leading to a pure, bright light. Now, here's the point I want to emphasize. It was unimaginable in 1917 by Einstein that 40 years later, his idea of spontaneous emission would lead to the purest, brightest light. Those experimental physicists in 1958 were a different had a different mentality. They were innovative, brilliant in a different way. Now, they in turn didn't realize and couldn't imagine that uh, a quarter of a century later, engineers would use the laser, this bright light, to reproduce music. Again, it's a different and a more practical mentality. I remember, and some of you might remember, uh, some of the older people here, when we first heard about the laser in the early 1960s, it was described as an invention looking for an application. Nobody knew what to do with it. It was wonderful, but what would you do? Now, it isn't only physics that's involved with this unanticipated connectedness. Uh, the delicate tracking involves uh, high-precision mechanical engineering, coding of the uh, sound into zeros and ones in ways that protect the signal of the disk against dust and scratches involves quite sophisticated mathematics. Conversion uh, uh, from and to electricity involves electronic and electronic engineering. The device has to be produced by businesses. It has to be advertised uh, uh, and the agents and the public. And of course, you, you need music as well. There are connections, connections and connections. But fundamentally, the compact disc player is a quantum physics machine. Now, with it, people could hear music perfectly reproduced anywhere in the world, essentially for the first time. You could take your compact disc player on the sea, you could go in the mountains, you could be in the desert, in the forests. So anybody could hear music perfectly reproduced. So that's my title. Quantum physics has democratized music. Now, I'm well aware of the complicated history of all inventions. The CD player was simply one stage in a long process that's continuing. Before the CD player, there was, of course, the gramophone. I can't resist showing this picture of Emil Berliner, who invented the world's first commercially successful gramophone. My mother's unmarried name was Berliner, and I had a cousin who was convinced that he must be one of our relatives. Unfortunately, it's quite a common name, and there's no evidence for it. I wish it were true. Um, well, the gramophone wasn't portable. Then there came the radio, a huge advance, but you couldn't choose what music to hear. 
Then some of you may remember the short-lived Walkman tape player. Now this was transportable and you could use it anywhere in the world, but it was very awkward to find on the tape the piece of music that you wanted. The CD player was the first fully functional, fully democratic way of reproducing music and finding the music easily that you wanted to hear. Now, of course, it has itself been superseded by MP3 players and iPhones, and they're more convenient still. They're also quantum machines. They're based on transistors. I chose a CD player simply to uh, make the point about connectedness. Here's another example. Here's some people, a Dutch family from the 1960s, watching television. Now, at the heart of the, those TVs, those old TVs, is uh, a cathode ray uh, tube. Here it is. Um, uh, and uh, in the cathode ray tube, uh, a picture is painted by electrons. Here's the picture being painted. And how is this painting uh, carried out? What drives the electrons? Well, an electromagnetic field is broadcast and uh, it's uh, received in the cathode ray tube and uh, it's, uh, it drives magnets. Here are the magnets. And how do the magnets drive the electron beam? By something called the Lorentz force. Now, here is Lorentz, a very great uh, uh, physicist. Uh, and what was he doing? He wasn't thinking about TV in 1890. He was completing the electrodynamics of Maxwell. Now, Maxwell, it, it was a fantastic moment in the history of physics. He realized in uh, the 1860s that light, electricity, and magnetism were all part of the same phenomenon, electromagnetism. A huge achievement. And he explained how these electromagnetic fields travel through uh, uh, space and time. Uh, and, and one of their manifestations is light. But what was left uncompleted was how those fields act on matter. And this was the Lorentz force, how the electric field and the magnetic field, relevant to the, uh, to the uh, uh, cathode ray tube, how they, uh, um, how they act on, on matter. Uh, here's uh, Lorentz's house in uh, the Netherlands. And on the wall of his house, you can see his... Uh, his uh, uh, force equations. Very good. Now, he, um, there it is. He, of course, didn't invent television, and that wasn't what he was thinking about at all. Uh, 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 he, uh, um, it was unimaginable to him that the force that he uh, uh, had understood would be used. Uh, uh, to television, but you can therefore say that for over half a century, when those TVs were, were used, the Lorentz force enabled mass entertainment. That's another example of an unanticipated uh, connection. Now, of course, TV was an invention by several people in the USA. They often uh, cite Philo Farnsworth, and I read uh, it was reported by his son that he didn't really approve of the medium that he had invented. Indeed, he, his son quotes him as saying, there's nothing on it worthwhile. We're not going to watch it in this household. I don't want it in your intellectual diet. <laughs> there we are. Okay. So uh, here's uh, now a third example before I go on to something else. Um, of course, we now have other... Uh, types of TV. It's been superseded. They're also physics machines, of course they are. Um, I want to talk about the invention of photography. In October 1833, a young English gentleman, Henry Fox Talbot, was on his honeymoon in Italy, and as was common in those days, uh, he was pretending he was an artist. He was sketching by the uh, shores of Lake Como. It was common in those days um, uh, to use a camera lucida. That's a, a projection device. It's a draftsman's aid 
where uh, a, a scene outside is projected down on the paper and you can draw around it. It's the basis of uh, a number of uh, paintings by serious artists as well as amateurs uh, like him. Uh, so here it is, um, uh, again, in use. Now, he saw projected on the pages of his notebook, sketchbook, an image of the Italian landscape. Uh, it, whoops, excuse me. Um, it seemed easy to uh, trace the features of the village buildings, the lake and the uh, distant mountains with his pencil. But it only seemed simple. He turned out he was useless as an artist and he wrote this. For when the eye was removed from the prism in which all looked beautiful, I found that the faithless pencil had only left traces on the paper, melancholy to behold. And here's his miserable, miserable picture. Now, and he recalled, and I'm quoting him, the inimitable beauty of the pictures of nature's painting which the glass lens of the camera throws upon the paper in its focus. And I went to this very place in Italy, and you see the, the scene itself, almost exactly the same. He thought how charming it would be if it were possible to cause these natural images to imprint themselves durably and remain fixed upon the paper. And after several years of experimentation, he invented the type of photography uh, uh, that we all use for more than 150 years. Now, the invention of photography was a complicated process. It involved Thomas Wedgwood, Nies von Nieps, also Daguerre, rather better known. He produced extremely beautiful uh, uh, pictures about the same time, the late 1830s, but you only one at a time, so they were individual works of art. Then the astronomer Herschel, and then Torbert himself. And uh, the unique and seminal contribution that he made was to invent the photographic negative, from which you could print any number of pictures and thereby democratize the image because people uh, anywhere in the world could, uh, uh, could then see scenes that they did not have to visit themselves. Um, Here's the first uh, pic print from the first photographic negative, 1835. It's, uh, it's near Bristol. It's a place called Laycock Abbey. You can visit it. And I went there, and this is the window itself. It's not a bad picture from 18, uh, 1835. So chemistry and optics democratized the image. Okay. Well, that was photography till the 1990s. It was democratic, but only imperfectly so, because you remember, some of you, uh, you, you had to go and take these plastic films to be developed by a specialist. You could do it yourself, but it was actually difficult. So you would take it to special shops and back would come your pictures. But then came digital. Digital uh, completed the democratization by giving individuals complete control uh, of the images. And instead of film, the image falls onto a CCD, a charge coupled device, um, capturing the light using the photoelectric effect, precisely the quantum process that started Einstein thinking about the quantization of light in his famous year 1905. So the democratization of the image is complete. There's a curious retro twist to this. You can now buy and download camera lucida apps for the uh, iPhone and the iPad, curious thing. Now, there's a bee in my bonnet. I think that English expression is known in India, right? It's a known expression. One of the bees in my bonnet, I'm changing gear now, is a strong dislike of the term the real world, often used by people, mainly people to, to do with finance and business, to contrast what they do with what we study remote from reality in the academic world. It is very strange that anyone could think that money is more real than electrons, atoms, stars and planets. Very strange. Ask yourself this question. The money in your bank account, where is it exactly? Think about it. Well, it's an abstraction. I'm not belittling it because it's an essential part of our humanity to uh, invent abstractions, equations, money, thing, and quickly come to regard them as existing independently of ourselves. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a very natural process. They're useful tools helping us to navigate uh, uh, with each other and between levels of uh, understanding in an otherwise inscrutable uh, universe. 
Now, of course, there is economic value in quantum physics, and it extends far beyond my little example of the CD player. I read that the high-energy experimental physicist, the Nobel Prize winner Leon Lederman, had uh, estimated that 25% of the gross national product of the industrialized world depended, exact, depended directly on quantum physics. Elsewhere, I read 30%. Somewhere else, I read one third. I wanted to track down the source of this estimate, and I found an interview with him. And Leon Lederman said, according to some absolutely closer to truth testimony I gave before Congress, quantum mechanics accounts for 37.9% of the gross natural product, or some number like that. <laughs> and the interviewer said, how did you get that percentage? And he replied, well, I made up the number, but it's, but it's plausible. You get it by tallying up what we have thanks to our understanding of the quantum theory. I'm still quoting him. Without that understanding, we would never have had transistors, therefore microprocessors. The whole microelectronics revolution wouldn't have taken place. Our computers wouldn't be what they are. The biotechnology revolution was catalyzed by Watson and Crick's discovery of the structure of DNA, which was stimulated by a book by Erwin Schrödinger on uh, the quantum theory of large molecules. The core products, he says, of 21st century technology, electronics, computers, biotech, all relate directly to understanding of quantum theory. Now, that quotation doesn't even mention lasers scanning our pro uh, pro purchases in every supermarket. Um, elsewhere, he mentions MRI scans, magnetic resonance imaging, imaging based on nuclear spins. What a pity that the word the N is omitted from NMR. It's because people are nervous about, uh, uh, about the word nuclear. I, I had an MRI scan myself, and I was lying there, and... Uh, I said to the operators, it's very good to see this nuclear magnetic resonance machine, this application of nuclear... They hadn't a clue what I was talking about. They didn't realise that there was the manipulation of nuclear spins that were responsible for making an image of actually of my heart. Um, never mind. Um, pos uh, PET scans, positron emission tomography, based on annihilation of particles and antiparticles, quantum physics and relativity, um, particle accelerators, cancer, plastics, diagnostic radiography. He gives estimates, so many billion dollars, this and that. Um, I don't know what it adds up to. It's certainly a lot. Now, all of this physics-based technology is, of course, wonderful. I could have given hundreds of examples, our whole, uh, ev everything. I mean, in this room, look at the recording apparatus and so on. Uh, it, it, it is based on, on physics. And actually, it's wonderful not only in the way I've been talking about. I'll get to that uh, in a while. But uh, Feynman put it in his inimitable way. He wrote, he said, physics is like sex. It has consequences, but that's not why you do it. <laughs> well, why do we do it? We do it to explain. We do it to understand things. Now, there are misunderstandings about understanding. A student I had, responding to my quantum mechanics lectures, wrote, you know, they have to respond and give their opinion of lectures. I enjoyed Professor Berry's lectures, but he didn't explain what use quantum mechanics is. All right, it explains things, but they would happen anyway. Now, I've talked about use of quantum mechanics. It invades our daily lives. But this remark, but they would happen anyway, raises deep questions about the relation between the world and our explanations of the world. Outside my uh, expertise, I sent that quotation to my philosophers in the philosophy department. It's for them to understand. Okay. Now, there's a, a pervasive misunderstanding, and it's associated with this fact. We can have a fundamental theory of uh, some particular phenomenon, or even, one can dream, a theory of everything, but its conceptual distance from the phenomenon is really too great to give a understandable explanation. You know, if you want to explain to somebody how a camera works, you talk about light rays and focusing by lenses. You don't start by writing down Maxwell's equations, and even more, you don't start by writing the quantum equations of electrodynamics uh, for, for the uh, quantum electromagnetic fields, QED. Now, 
string theory is a current uh, uh, front runner in this brave effort to explain everything. But the point that I'm making was made by the novelist Ian McEwan in a very clever way. The point that a theory of everything might be powerless to explain any particular thing. And in the novel, it's a novel is called Solar, there's a badly behaved string theorist whose wife catches him in, an un, in a compromising situation with another woman. And he says, this string theorist, he wants to reassure her, don't worry, my dear, I can explain everything. <laughs> well, I sent that to my philosophers as well, and they discussed it for days because it, raise, it raises questions, deep questions about how f physics, or more generally, so at a higher level of generality, um, can include other theories, usually older ones, as special cases of more restricted applicability, but which actually are more effective in explaining phenomena. It's called the, the philosophical problem of theory reduction. I have a great deal to say about it, but not today. I wouldn't be true to my craft as a theoretical physicist if I didn't explain something to you. And I will. It's not my work. It's something I particularly like. It's the explanation of something very familiar. Why is gold golden? Well, um, you, you, this is a question about the quantum physics of condensed matter. Uh, the colour comes from the light reflected by surfaces. It's the light that's not absorbed. And what is the colour? It's yellow plus shiny, you could say. Uh, so here it is. The, uh, the white light uh, comes in and uh, all the light is absorbed except the, the gold light. Now, if you want to understand this, why is it that colour? You uh, need... It involves the interaction of light with the electrons in the crystal structure. That's a quantum question. It involves solving the Schrodinger equation. The light's absorbed if it interacts strongly with the electrons. And uh, it, it's a long and detailed calculation, computer calculation. You can't do it just by writing. It's not that kind of calculation. Uh, based quantum mechanics using the Schrodinger equation. And it wasn't done until computers became capable and programs of, of doing these calculations in the 1990s. And uh, the colour that resulted from the calculation was silver. <laughs> well, clearly something was wrong, and it was quickly realised what was wrong. What was wrong is that uh, uh, gold is heavy, and that means that its inner electrons, or relevant electrons, move fast, so fast that they're ratio with the speed of light is not negligible and you have to include Einstein's relativity in the calculation. Now, um, the, the, the way to do that is to use not the Schrodinger equation but a relativistic version uh, called the Dirac equation. Uh, Dirac, uh, certainly the greatest uh, intellect that my city, Bristol, ever produced. It's where he was born, where he grew up. Um, well, relativistic condensed matter calculations were possible and a colleague of mine was one of the leaders in that uh, uh, world. They called uh, relativistic band structure calculations, these are the energy bands in the solids. And uh, when you do that, uh, the colour comes out right. So, what do we learn from this? Several things. Gold is relativistic silver, was one thing. But the, the, deeper, thing, the, the deeper thing that you learn uh, is this, that uh, to understand this phenomenon, the colour of this metal that has beguiled and entranced and encouraged the greed of humanity for thousands of years, you need the two great physics achievements of the 20th century. You need quantum physics of the small and you need uh, uh, relativity the physics of the fast. So it's a wonderful unification to explain this uh, uh, phenomenon that is familiar to uh, everybody. Well, I spoke about this uh, some uh, years ago in Hyderabad, and somebody pointed out to me that there had been published recently in Physical Review Letters another example of this unexpected influence of relativity, which is the lead-acid battery that uh, you use to start your car. And it works like this. I mean, uh, of course, that was invented independently of, of quantum physics. And it's quite tricky to do the quantum mechanics of where the voltage comes from. It, it, it involves this uh, uh, electrochemistry, which is a very tricky subject. But the calculations were done, 
and uh, it realized that uh, something like uh, between 80 and 90 percent of the voltage comes only when you include relativity because lead is heavy. It's why you don't have a tin acid battery. So every time you start your car, you're using a relativistic quantum effect. It's very interesting. Now, I've talked about uh, some examples of technology that uh, wouldn't have been invented without physics, the compact disc player, or chemistry, photography. And nowadays, the principle is well understood. We emphasize to our politicians that uh, any uh, advance in fundamental science, any investment in fundamental science is uh, likely to generate enormously disproportionate uh, rewards, although not predictably and certainly not to order. They don't like that. I mean, I had a colleague who used to say, uh, didn't convince the, 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 the politicians at all, Michael Faraday paid for us forever. Okay. Um, but uh, what we don't usually emphasize although it's instantly familiar to every working scientist, is that uh, new technology also generates new science. And I just note in passing, it also generates new art. Um, the science writer Philip Ball, in his book Bright Earth, explores in great detail how over several millennia, every development in fabric dyeing or paint technology was immediately adopted by painters eager to, uh, uh, to, to exploit new sources of colour or new ways to get colours onto surfaces. It's a fundamental influence uh, of the uh, development of visual art on technology, which is usually not emphasised by art historians who are not technical people. Uh, now it's continuing. I mean, David Hockney now produces beautiful pictures on his iPad, again using the latest technology. Well, all scientists use the latest technology in their research, but we don't often comment on it. And my own research as a theoretical physicist has been transformed by the quantum technologies of computers, lasers, and digital photography. And I want to give a few examples, little vignettes from uh, uh, research over many years. Here is a two pictures from Oriental magic mirror. What's that? It's a cast bronze mirror, about so big, uh, uh, shiny and polished. And you see, you can uh, reproduce um, uh, images moderately well. They're reasonably, uh, reasonably high stand. You can take s pictures outside or a picture of my uh, daughter as she then was. Nothing apparently magic there. But the magic comes when you do something different. See, on the back of the mirror, there's a deep cast relief pattern. This particular one has uh, patterns, uh, signs of the zodiac. And you normally don't see that. It's on the back. Now, here it is. And if instead of looking in the mirror, you shine light on it, you take it outside or shine a torch on, and then you look at the reflection on a, on a wall or a screen, what you expect to see, and you do see, is a bright uh, circle, a circular patch, a disk of light. But what you don't expect to see, and the people who in the Han Dynasty 2,500 years ago didn't expect to see from the mirrors they had made, is that on that disk of light is a ghostly image of the pattern that's on the back. There's a picture of it. Now, uh, when those mirrors were brought to the West in the 19th century, there were various speculations on uh, uh, how this image could be formed. Is it polarized light? Did the light penetrate the mirror somehow? Both those are wrong. Um, but it was realized before too long that uh, what is happening is that uh, during the process of casting and cooling and vigorous polishing and the release of elastic stresses, a faint image of what's on the back is reproduced on the front surface, too faint for you to see. It, 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 I've exaggerated it there. But then the question remained, it's an optics question. How can something that you can't see produce such a striking image? And it isn't an image in the usual sense. If it were, you'd have to focus it. It would only appear at a given distance. But it appears over a huge range of distances between your mirror and, 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 and the screen. Well, uh, it was realized that um, what underlies it is a, a very simple but unexplored region of ray optics. 
the curvatures of the surface concentrate the light, but they're not strong enough to focus it. They concentrate the light, a kind of pre-focal brightening. And the theory made a specific prediction that the intensity of the pattern you see is something called, that people will know what this is, or you don't know, it doesn't matter, called the Laplacian. It's the slope of the slope. Um, it's the, curv the curvature of the surface. It's very precise. And, uh, uh, well, one immediate thing you can do is you can simulate this function. There's the image and there's the simulated curvature. But you can do something else because it makes a very specific prediction. The back of the mirror is composed of a series of steps up to down. And if you take this Laplacian, every step should have a bright side and a dark side. You do indeed see that. You can see here you have a bright side and a dark side. But one thing you can do, um, and indeed you can do it by taking a picture with your digital camera, your quantum machine, and putting it in your computer, uh, another quantum machine in your laptop, uh, you, can hit, you can scan a part of it, and, uh, and you can then smooth it up and down here on the computer, and now you see more clearly the bright side and the dark side. You can scan that, and then you can see, you can tell that the height of the steps is a few hundred nanometers, the height of the steps on the front, which is too small for you to see. So that explains why it is that you can, uh, uh, that, that, uh, how this magic mirror works, which has been puzzling for so long. Now, if I would have done this research three decades ago, I would have needed image capturing equipment and image processing software costing tens of thousands of dollars. Five decades ago, it would have been so laborious that nobody would have even bothered. But now, with ordinary uh, commercial digital cameras and uh, standard mathematical software on a laptop like this, theorists like me are liberated to do research of this kind ourselves. We can pretend to be experimental physicists. So it's no exaggeration to say that quantum technology enabled the explanation of a mystery that was several thousand years old. Very good. Now, by the way, this optics is useful. It's a lensless way of, uh, 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 of seeing, literally seeing, imperfections on the surface of uh, semiconductor wafers. It's used in Japan. It's called makyo imaging. Makyo comes from the means wonder mirror imaging. Um, something else, I have a project now to create a magic window. Magic window is a, a transmission version you would have uh, what looks to you like a perfectly transparent window. You look through it, you don't see anything unusual. If you let light shine on it and look on the ground, you would see uh, uh, an image that you had chosen. And there's a precise way you can, you can choose what surface relief, invisible to the eye, you can put on the, uh, on, on, on the glass it's, uh, in order to reproduce that structure. It's, by the way, not a trivial uh, uh, exercise in glass form, which is why I'm collaborating with an expert in that uh, technology. Um, just to let me show you this. Sometimes with old windows, if the sun is in the right place, you can see on the wall patterns like this. That's because those windows when you look out, they seem perfectly normal, but they're not as flat as they should be. Over time, they've decayed. Well, the Magic Window Project will control images of this kind. This was a picture in a house I stayed in just very recently in uh, Florida. Okay, now something else. A completely different example of uh, use of quantum technology to learn something new. In quantum physics, microscopic objects are represented by waves. The strength of the wave gives the probability of, uh, at any place, of detecting a particle there. And this fundamental aspect of the world, I told you before, was anticipated by Einstein and made uh, uh, def expressed clearly by Max Born. It seems mysterious, a wave of probability, nothing you've ever heard of before. Well, you have heard of a wave of probability. You've heard of a crime wave. That's a wave of probability moving across a town, giving the probability that an unfortunate event will occur, but you can't predict exactly where. Of course, there are differences between that wave and quantum waves, which are very deep, but the notion of a wave of probability is not something that you haven't heard before. OK. Now, sometimes these quantum waves, they start out concentrated. We call them wave packets. 
and they travel in ways a bit like the particles in the old Newtonian uh, physics. Experimentally, you can generate these packets by taking an atom, zapping it with a laser, and forcing one of the electrons into a distant orbit where it, the wave packet moves a bit like a planet in the solar system. But there's a difference. In these planetary atoms, the electron wave packet gradually spreads until it fills the whole orbit in a narrow wing, ring of probability. And about 20 years ago, or 30, it was realized, again by a theoretical analysis of quantum equations, that there's a more surprising difference. After a very long time, this ring of probability reconcentrates and you get the original packet again. This spreads, reconcentrates, and it happens a number of times. These are quantum revivals. The original packet somehow gets reborn. Now, those quantum equations look complicated, and they are complicated. Okay. But with computers, quantum machines, we can bring the mathematics to life as pictures. Now, this was not always appreciated. You know, there's a cliche. A picture is worth a thousand words. But we scientists, who are theorists, all know that notwithstanding that, an equation um, uh, is an economical representation of infinitely many pictures. It summarizes them. But economy and worth aren't uh, the same thing. And uh, the extreme compactness of equations can sometimes make it difficult to appreciate and understand what they contain. Well, I'm going to show you some pictures of, of this phenomenon. I'm going to illustrate it not with atoms, but with a simple example of quantum particles bouncing back and forth between parallel walls. When you teach quantum mechanics, and students here might remember this, it's called the particle in a box. But I'll tell you something un unusual about it. Well, here's what a particle would do in uh, classical physics, a classical particle. Here it is. Now, sideways is going to be space, and up is going to be time. So there are walls, the left side and the right side. Uh, uh, here's one wall, here's the other. But what does this particle do? Well, it starts to move. It moves in time, and it bounces, and it moves, and it bounces, and so on. And that's all it does, classically. Now, what about quantum mechanics? You start a little wave packet there, and then you let it evolve. And, uh, and here's what you see. Now, what, what I'm showing you is the, the early evolution. It's, in this case, one twentieth of this revival time, which you don't yet see. Well, what does it do? It starts, to, uh, uh, it starts to propagate, it bounces, it then realizes that it's a wave and interferes with itself where they overlap, and, it, and then it spreads, and quite soon it would cover the whole space between the two uh, walls. It's nice to see, but it's uh, slightly uh, less obvious than the previous picture, but not really surprising. The true value of representing mathematics pictorially comes um, when uh, uh, you ask... Uh, uh, excuse me, I've got ahead of myself. There's another feature which I didn't mention. After some time, this original shape will revive, right? But at fractions of that time, let's say one-third, you see a series of repetitions of the original packet if it's one-third, you see three. If it's two-sevenths, you see seven. A half, you see two. And this is often uh, described as the electron being in several places at once. That's a misguided terminology. It's a confused way of saying that the probability of finding the one electron is divided into two uh, several parts. You know, if, I'm, uh, if somebody knows that I randomly spend half my time in my office and half my time at home, they don't think I am divided into two parts. They know it's a probability of, of, of finding me. So if you want to use this expression, the electron is in two places at once, you have to very carefully deconstruct the word is. And, uh, and this is a problem. I'm not going to discuss it. A lot of philosophers uh, talk about it. Uh, never mind. Um, anyway, let me show you this uh, two-split. Um, you see, this bounces, it interferes, it spreads. And here's now nearly halfway between nine twentieths and one half. Um, and here you see now these two packets coming together, interfering and coming together. 
Well, that's interesting, and, but again, it's more or less what you'd expect. The true value comes when you look at the whole structure from time zero through this time halfway up to the revival time, and then you get to what's called a quantum carpet woven by extreme interference. Now, this was an unexpected picture. You see, the, the bit at the bottom uh, here is what I showed you first of all. Here's the particle beginning to propagate, interfering and spreading. But what was surprising was these diagonal lanes. We didn't expect that. It took a lot of effort to understand uh, them uh, uh, m mathematically, uh, but eventually uh, we were able to, to do it. Um, now, what this means is that uh, quantum physics, with uh, my computer and its transistors, enabled me to understand quantum physics. OK, this is quantum physics. Now. Related to this, uh, that's what, what I've just said. Now, related to this is uh, another example of my underlying theme of unexpected connections. You see, we theoretical physicists are never happier than when we discover that something in one area of physics is directly related, uh, has the same structure, mathematically isomorphic, the same structure as something which we thought was completely different. And uh, uh, it, uh, the physicists who studied quantum revivals in the early 1990s didn't realize that this phenomenon is mathematically identical to something discovered in optics in 1836 by the same Henry Fox Talbot. He was a very interesting individual um, who we've already met, uh, who invented the photographic negative. And what he was doing was experimenting with light transmitted by a fine grid, what we call a diffraction uh, grating. And he noticed by uh, if, if, looking at the Looking at the, 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 the grid, you can, you can put a screen there or you can use a magnifying glass. If you go very close, of course, you see the lines of the grid if they're not too close. But when you look farther and farther away, put a screen, it blurs out and gets, very, gets more and more complicated. But uh, he noticed that uh, at different distances, the grid itself came back into focus and went out again. In focus, out of focus, in focus, out of focus. And uh, he guessed that those repetitions had something to do with the, what was then the new idea of wave interference, but the full mathematical explanation had to wait until the 1990s. Now, the formulas for Torbert repetitions at different distances are identical with those for quantum revivals at different times because the governing equations uh, of the quantum and the light are similar uh, to each other. And by the way, in the mathematics, there's yet another connection because uh, the mathematics was the first application to physics of uh, something uh, uh, abstract mathematics discovered by the young Gauss in the early 1900s, things called the Gauss sums of number theory. Very surprising, unexpected thing. Now, I'm going to briefly illustrate this same point, that the same mathematics and describe very different physics, by showing you something I learned not too long ago. Max Born, I mentioned this already, his thesis in 1906 involved the stability of bent elastic wires, and he created this picture, this graph. Now, here's a picture from my PhD thesis, 60 years later, on the interaction of one kind of wave with another, how light interacts with sound. And uh, here's a picture. I was unaware of Max Born. Here it is. Well, you know, no comment except that... Uh, except that uh, it's exactly the same underlying mathematical structure, which, by the way, involves yet a different kind of mathematics. Ideas developed in the 1800s of ways of calculating the length of the perimeter of ellipses. Nothing to do with either of these things. Wonderful underlying uh, connections. Now, my thesis was about uh, what happens when this pattern is decorated with waves, particularly light waves. And to do that, I used the first and probably the only commercial analog computer. And I recently found a picture of it, this thing, um, in which the bits of the equation were, were uh, 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 got by connecting cords into sockets, and then I, the numbers in the equations were got by changing dials. And the result came out on a... Um, oscilloscope screen, and I had to take pictures of it uh, using, a, uh, using a Polaroid camera. 
and that, those pictures were pasted into my thesis. And in case any of you computer scientists, computer science in Bangalore is, of course, very strong, you lead the world in IT, here's my computer program from 1963. There it is. Not like a program you have now. Okay, well, as Steve Jobs used to say at the Apple computer development and revelation of new uh, machines celebrations, he used to say one more thing. Now, pretty well everything that I and my fellow physicists uh, uh, do exploits this technology developed recently, all dependent on quantum physics. I could go on and on with examples. But now just one more. For many years, I've been exploring a cluster of connections between quantum mechanics, chaos theory, and the prime numbers. Now, the primes, numbers that can be uh, divided only by themselves and by one, atoms of arithmetic, are distributed with an exquisite combination of regularity and randomness. We know the average density, if you go high and high, uh, they gradually get sparser as you go higher and higher. The probability that a number will be a prime gets smaller and smaller. But it's still very hard to predict individual primes. Now, this sounds very abstract, but you depend on this every time you uh, get money from a bank machine or make a transaction online because your data is encrypted in a code whose security depends on the extraordinary difficulty of decomposing very large numbers into their prime factors. But there is structure in the way that the primes scatter about their average. And if you represent the fluctuations on a graph, I'll show you in a minute, this can be decomposed into regular oscillations, much in the same way as a musical sound can be decomposed into its uh, harmonies, the pure tones. This was understood in the mid-19th uh, century. People marvel at it. The contemporary mathematician Enrico Bombieri, he wrote, to me, uh, that the distribution of prime numbers can be so accurately represented in a harmonic analysis. It's absolutely amazing and incredibly beautiful. It tells of an arcane music and a secret harmony composed by the prime numbers. Now, there's more to this. It turns out that those frequencies, the harmonies in the music of the primes, are mathematically similar to the distribution of energy levels of quantum particles where, if they were classical particles, they would move chaotically. So there's that connection. It's uh, the subject of focused attention by mathematician and physicist like me pretending to do mathematics for several decades. It's a, a tantalizing connection because we don't know all about it but uh, 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 the idea has been confirmed by computations, quantum machines and so on. But it occurred to me that nobody had heard this music of the primes and I wanted to listen to it acoustically using our perception of sound rather than, uh, r rather than uh, our vision. Now, at the moment, it's more fun than useful, but I want to finish by telling you about it. So here are some graphs of fluctuations of the primes, never mind the details. If you, if you zoom out, you see it looks like a, a noisy picture, and if you zoom into another part of it, you see a fractal structure. You can sort of understand this. But if this is a sound signal, well, you're going to hear it now. I warn you, it's the most horrible sound you've ever heard. So, uh, wait. So this is the music of the primes. However, if instead of this, you make the music of the music of the primes, if you take the harmonies, and uh, there's a piece of mathematics, it has a name, it's called the zeta function, and every place where it passes through zero is one of those frequencies. If you convert that into, into sound, you get something different. Uh, you get uh, the siren song of zeta, as I call it, the function. And uh, it depends on how, how you compress it, how much you want to hear. So this is the siren song.
And if you compress it more, you get a banshee wail of a witch. Okay. Now, if you want to understand why these mathematical objects sound the way they do, you need a great deal of interesting mathematics. Some of it not written down by Riemann, or rather not written up by Riemann, but written in his notebooks, which were only discovered 50 years after his death, and are famously untidy. You see, this is what we tell students not to do. You mustn't scribble. But hidden in there, hidden in there, was at the bottom, was a formula which nobody had discovered in the meantime, which is a wonderful way of calculating these quantities. Now, you need that, and you need modern developments using algebra with computers, and then you can understand, I won't go into it, why these sounds sound the way they do. Now, this idea of listening to mathematics, um, I've uh, explored... Uh, uh, to some extent, with Pragya Shukla, who's here, from Karagpur, I call it ear math. And uh, I just want to end with two sounds. You see, it's remarkable how easy it is to make sounds that nobody has ever heard before using mathematics. There's a branch of mathematics called random matrix theory, which I don't want to talk about or explain, but uh, you can render uh, some of the objects in that theory with sound. And, uh, uh, and here's one of the sounds, okay. And here's a different piece of the mathematics, as some, something called a characteristic polynomial. And the idea is that since ears perceive things differently, you can, and it, to some extent it works, hear distinctions that are hard to see if you, drop, if you plot graphs. As, as I said, hearing is different. Okay, well... I want to sum up this talk. Now, it risks trivialising it because it risks obscuring the details whose importance I've emphasised. But here it is. Physics leads to technology, often after long times and in unexpected ways. I've given you examples of that. And we do physics not only to apply it, but also to understand, to explain things. This is Feynman's uh, uh, comment. And then, of course, the counter, the opposite process, new technology leads to new physics. Now, when I say this, uh, it's immediately clear to everybody that they sort of knew it all, all along. But I think it's the examples that are interesting. And I want to end with a quote. I've, I've adapted this quote from the uh, numerical analyst uh, Beresford uh, Parlett. And he said, and it certainly resonates very strongly with my own approach to doing science, only wimps study only the general case. Real scientists explore specific examples. Stop. I want to make a comment. I often make it in public talks of this kind. There are no stupid questions. Okay. There's a question. Can't hear you. I don't hear too well, so speak loudly anyway when you get the microphone. Hello. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'll quickly skip to the question. Uh, the question is, how... Uh, Will you please explain about the conservation of quantum information in the first place? That's the first part. And the second part is I want you to tell me what is the significance of Schrodinger's wave equation to physical reality? Yeah. I can talk about the second question, conservation of information. Well, it's a huge subject. I don't have strong opinions about it, and it wasn't related to what I talked about. It's, an in it's a very interesting subject, of course. Um, uh, well, of course, you lose information and you gain it. You gain it in your experiments and you lose it when systems forget their past by interacting with their environments. Because uh, uh, it's related to this question, uh, this, this fact that uh, you can never study the whole universe. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, sometimes it doesn't matter because your system is well insulated from what's outside, but uh, you can never insulate it completely. And it turns out that uh, some quantum phenomena are exquisitely sensitive to uh, uh, interactions with the outside, which you would never think of including in your calculations, but which destroy the coherence of waves which lead you to uh, uh, draw certain conclusions. So that's, it's called decoherence. Actually, 
uh, just to make a comment, it was understood in a certain sense in 1800 by Thomas Young, because he's the person who convinced us with experiments on light, now it's light, but it's the same, it's the same physics, the same mathematics, that uh, light is a wave phenomenon, you see interference. But he had to explain to people, to critics, why don't you see these interferences all the time? He did the experiments with candle flames. So he had to understand what we call decoherence. Of course, it's much richer, much more sophisticated. That was the first question. The second question about the relation between the Schrodinger equation or wave function and physical reality. And it, that, there it's the, the following. Uh, it's, uh, all our physical theories are ways of understanding not only the world, but our interaction with the world. We're studying particular parts of the world and we're using our own concepts and our own uh, 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 technologies and their own mathematics that we've developed up to this limited stage in our evolution. And uh, so we use the mathematics that we're capable of developing at any stage in human existence. Earlier physics would have been, in, uh, earlier physics would not have been able to comprehend quantum mechanics because the mathematics wasn't developed. Likewise, Newton had to develop his own mathematics to do calculus. Um, so what the wave equation tells us, it's a way of us calculating things that we can see in our experiments. Now. Of course, the reality is much more complicated. It can never be grasped. We're always studying a tiny part of the universe. There may be, we know many uh, scientists doubts that uh, there is something real, but I find it doesn't help to use the word real. It's a good mental exercise to do physics and avoid using the word real. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's all much the same, actually. You describe the results of experiments and observations and you have explanations of natural phenomena insofar as uh, uh, they, they, they uh, uh, reflect uh, things that we can observe and measure, but you almost never need to use the term real. We do in casual speech, of course we do, but if you want to really nail it down, I think it becomes unprofitable. So that's my answer to your questions. Okay, thank you so much. There's a question at the back. Uh, this, there are two questions. One is, uh, is the process of quantum revivals... Can you keep it closer? Can you keep it Is the process of quantum revivals similar to breathers, solitons, things like that? Second, is the distribution of primes quasi-periodic? Is it, what about the distribution, what's the question about primes? Uh, is it quasi-periodic, quasi-periodic, like Penrose tilings and things like that? Quasi-periodic. Quasi oh, no. No, 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 certainly not. It has a different structure. In fact, if I can be technical for a second, it's uh, part of the structure, not all of it. The, 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 the relation between uh, nearby, the harmonies involved in, in, in uh, uh, long-range distributions of primes, the nearby harmonies, they're related to what I would call the spectra of random matrices of a certain type. What was your first question? Uh, is the process of quantum revivals uh, related... Similar to the breakers in solitons and things like that. I mean, so, repeated coming together. Uh, sorry, I don't understand the question. Could, could somebody... Is it similar to solitons, breakers? Breakers. Uh, it's whether the revivers that you showed were yes. similar to solitons or... No, no, a good question. No, is the answer. It's different mathematics. It, 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 it's, it's just different. So it's, thank you. It's a sens sensible thing to ask, but different. There's a question here. Um, uh, hello, Professor. What are your views on the high level of ab abstraction used in modern mathematics? Because as you, uh, your, the quotation used in the end, so the general case might not always lead to any re so-called real-life applications. But uh, mathematicians still use the most, ab most ab abstracted techniques. Yeah. Th th there's a, a lot of taste in this. I never thought when I was uh, uh, learning as a physicist, that I would need to know number theory. But when chaos theory came up, uh, the, at the heart of chaos are, uh, are what's called resonances, and resonance to a physicist is rationality to a mathematician. A, 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 ra a resonance is that a certain number is a rational number, three halves or seven fourths and so on. So I find I had to learn some of this number theory. Now. Um, that's rather old-fashioned number theory, but it was new to me. The physicists who, uh, uh, before quantum mechanics, 
never thought they would need to use matrix theory. It was a very abstract bit of... When quantum mechanics was invented, it took a little while to realize that the clearest way of expressing it is matrix theory. People who regularly use the electron microscope to look at solids do their calculations involving the Schrodinger equation, matrices, you know, they almost take it for granted that that's what they need. So I, and this process continues. I mean, uh, before Newton, the idea that you have a second order differential equation was unknown, and uh, it was revolutionary that he both invented that mathematics because he needed it to explain mechanics. It was extremely abstract at the time. So when I see abstract mathematics now, which I can't understand, I don't dismiss it. I think, well, I don't understand it, but uh, it's very likely it'll be used someday. And, and there's a, a philosophical r reason for this, and I, I, almost, I mentioned it earlier, but I would say we have only been thinking scientists on this earth for a tiny fraction of uh, the existence of the earth, and even a very small fraction of our life as human beings, if you go and include the Hindu and the Muslim mathematics, it's just a, 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 a thousand years, it's a tiny fraction of time. And since the acceleration of science as a communal activity is just a few hundred years. Now, at any stage, you know, we're limited creatures. At any stage, we're only capable of understanding those features of the world which uh, we're able to conceptualize. Now, what are the most sophisticated concepts that human beings invent at any stage? It's mathematics. So it's quite natural that uh, the physics of any time will use sophisticated mathematics recently developed at that time. Sometimes the mathematics comes first, some of the physics comes That's a detail. I mean, who does what? But essentially, they involve... It's a whole other lecture, which I'm not going to give now. They involve... It's sort of more or less in step. So we're limited in our understanding by the mathematics we can do it. I'm speaking about the physical world. Um, and so uh, it's quite natural that as mathematics gets more abstract and more encompassing, so the physics that we can, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, create using this mathematics, it may not be correct because physics theories are often wrong, but anyway, the, the, the physical theories that we conceive will use this mathematics. It's not surprising. So, for example, although string theory has yet not reached a stage where it's directly confronted with any experiments or observations that we can make or even imagine making, probably at some stage this will happen, it uses mathematics and mathematicians say that the boldness of the string theorists has led to mathematical conjectures in different areas of mathematics which the mathematicians are now investigating and proving. So there's this in-step process. So I don't disparage abstract mathematics even though at the latest, most advanced mathematics, I don't understand it. We had in Bristol last week a, uh, a wonderful meeting called Perspectives on the Riemann Hypothesis involving this prime number business. And it was fascinating for me to hear these, what I call the big beasts of number theory. Uh, I felt like an anthropologist in observing a strange culture. And what surprised me was that at the forefront of the subject, these mathematicians were very, very different from each other. I don't mean the difference of personalities. This is true of every group of people. But I mean the differences in their approach and the mathematical culture, the ideas they brought to bear. It was very, very instructive. So this was actually at the cold face. If, the, if in the, as we're gradually abandoning coal, we could still speak about the cold face. Anyway, it, 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 at the cold face, how people have very different cultures that come together, even within a subject like mathematics. Enough. Uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful talk, Professor. Uh, I had a, a small, it's not a small question though, but so is there a single order parameter that could differentiate classical and quantum physics? Planck's constant. So, exactly. So the Planck's constant under the semi-classical limits, I see papers writing limit h tending to zero. So what does that exactly what it, mean? What it means is this. Planck's constant is a number that has dimensions. So its value depends on the system of units you use. So, what it, so it, ha it has a, a value, and it's, you, you measure it, you can't change it. But what it means is it's the dimensionless number you get if you divide Planck's constant by some classical quantity with the same dimensions. It's action, actually. So, for example, so you, the semi-classical limit... In, 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 it could be, for example, the mass becoming large or the s scales becoming large. So this dimensionless version of Planck's constant is, is small. 
that's if, what that's what it means. So if I were to define what quantum is, so what would be? The uh, it, it's complicated because it depends on the context, the way in which uh, uh, the way in which the the, the quantum you have to divide Planck by to get the number which, when small, gives you classical differs from application to application. It always has a plank on the top. And it's actually a very rich limit. And there's philosophy in the richness of this limit. It's this, that uh, uh, normally you think, well, something goes to zero if you express it right. You'll get classical when you start with quantum. You actually don't. And the reason is that the limit is very singular. It's very, and I'll give an example of a singular limit, this. You uh, bite into an apple. and uh, you encounter a maggot, and you're disappointed, of course. If you bite into an apple and encounter half a maggot, you're even more disappointed. If you have a third of a maggot, even more. Taking the limit, if you have no maggot at all, you should be infinitely disappointed, but you're not. That's a singular limit. Now, in physics, almost all, almost, in physics, almost all the limits in physics are singular, and this has a very strong implication. It means that on the way to the limit, you get borderland phenomena living, living between the two theories. And to really get from one to the other, say quantum expansion, you, so you have to do something like this. You have to realize that, for example, the interference fringes, which will get more and more delicate as you go to the classical limit, but they would always be there strictly. They're washed away because of interactions with the environment. That's this decoherence I mentioned. And that is very sensitive to the value of Planck's constant. So there are additional factors and complications. But if you do keep the coherence, then there are phenomena. For example, the distribution of high-lying energy levels of atoms and molecules, is, which is a quantum thing because they're energy levels, but is a semi-classical because they're high-lying, that distribution is very different if the underlying classical physics will be chaotic or not chaotic. That's the whole subject of quantum chaology. In condensed matter physics, there are things called critical phenomena, which live in the borderland between statistical physics, where you consider the, 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 the behavior of the atoms and the molecules bouncing around, and thermodynamics when you treat them as a continuum. Usually, you can smoothly go from one to the other when the number of particles is very large, uh, because you have this picture in your mind that the, if you go far away, you don't see the atoms, you see a continuum. But near a critical point, there are fluctuations on all scales. So however far away you go, you never reach that continuum. And underlying this is a whole world of beautiful physics that has been elucidated in the last uh, half century. An unsolved problem of this kind is fluid motion where the viscosity goes to zero. Now, that's fluid which becomes infinitely slippery. And very often viscosity is small, you can neglect it. But however, you find that what happens as the viscosity goes to zero, dissipation, the friction in the fluid, goes to zero. But it does so in a way that's distributed in a fractal way across the material. And that leads to the problem of turbulence. That's an intermediate phenomenon, the borderland phenomenon of very small viscosity, large Reynolds number, as they say. It's not understood now. It's very, very hard. Lots of bits of it are understood, but the detailed laws of that borderland phenomenon are not understood. This is a very general notion in physics, which I've been trying to persuade philosophers about for several decades, and there are a few now who have understood this perspective, but most philosophers are not mathematical. You see, the question being asked, how does one theory relate to another on a, on a deeper level as some quantity goes to zero? It involves a kind of singular limits which is not in their vocabulary. They, try to, they think you can understand these connections using words, but you can't. Okay. One at the back. Doctor, the subject of your thesis is very interesting. Are there any co commercial applications to acoustic effects and optical phenomena? No idea. I mean, I, I, you know, it's, we're talking about something I did 60 years ago in my babyhood. Um, uh, there was, in the 30s, a form of television called the Scophony television system, which involved light going through sound, which was encoded with the picture that you wanted to produce, and that led with the light to an image. It worked, but it didn't compete with the, uh, with the cathode ray tube and, uh, and, and other techniques. So there was an application which was never really commercial. There's, there is, okay, so I haven't followed this. My book, which was essentially my thesis, is cited by people in various 
areas of application. For example, free electron lasers involves similar mathematics, but uh, I haven't followed this, I, I, so I can't answer your question in any intelligent way. Yeah. Thanks. Again, uh, my question is more uh, 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 philosophical and mm -hmm. uh, non-technical, is that you mentioned at some point that it was the invention that was waiting for an application. And there was a the big laser, gap. yeah. Yeah, and there was a big gap between when it was discovered I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. and, and then when the application came in. Do you yes. see that gap narrowing down that now applications will now look for inventions? or? or well, it or depends on the area. I mean, of course, you see now the case was where uh, people are directly using uh, 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 recent physics for applications, certainly in quantum information. I mean, this is a major example. But I don't think in general it's narrowing, and there always were some time scales which are short and time scales which are long. And if you would ask me what are the areas where the time scales are long, I would tell you you can't predict them. I don't know because it's unexpected. I mean, just think about the compact disc player. Who, who expected that, you know, in 1982 after, after the laser of 25 years and, and, and even the laser after 40 years from Einstein, you know? There are a couple of questions from people who've been watching the live oh, yes. stream. Oh, yes, okay. Uh, so one from Rachna asks, uh, can open questions in mathematics, like the Riemann hypothesis, be approached through a physics uh, or approaches so that you can go for Oh, that? yes. Well, th th this is the dream of us amateurs, physicists, uh, pretending to do, to do mathematics. The, what we've contributed uh, to the study of this... Okay. Underlying these harmonies of the primes is a problem which is a central problem of mathematics. It's called the Riemann hypothesis. And it's the idea that in the, in the proper graphical representation, all of these harmony, these numbers, lie on a certain line. Um, and this is conjectured by Riemann, and it's widely considered one of the most difficult problems in mathematics today. And the idea is that uh, if these harmonies are related to the same kind of mathematics that uh, describes vibrations, quantum vibration, whatever. So they will be the numbers uh, uh, describing the vibrations of some system, some super sophisticated drum or atom or molecule. Then it would automatically be true that they would lie on a line. Now there's some evidence from the formal structure of this thing called the Riemann zeta function. There are analogies with, uh, with quantum mechanics which when we've applied them, we've used quantum mechanics to tell the mathematicians new things about these harmonies in the primes, which they didn't know before, rather sophisticated things, which leads, lends plausibility to this idea. But we don't know what the system is that has this structure. We know that it's chaotic, we know that it, uh, it's, it has periodic trajectories whose lengths are multiples of logarithms of prime numbers, we know lots of things, but we don't know what it is, and there's a missing ingredient and if that missing ingredient is found, then uh, this idea will be justified and the approach via physics will have contributed to the solution of this problem. But if not, if the real hypothesis is false, some of these numbers don't lie on the line, very high ones. They have to be higher than trillions because trillions have been actually detected to be on the line and it's the kind of mathematics and computing that gives you an exact result, not approximate, then we'd be wrong and there'd be some reason why uh, the good Lord is so malicious that he tempts us or she tempts us into uh, thinking uh, that uh, physics will be useful in the end, it ultimately will be wrong. So we don't know, but uh, that's, the, that's the underlying idea. So there's one more question again from somebody online called Goyal. So how far are we from explaining every bit of quantum mechanics? I don't know what the question means, because, uh, no, 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 really, uh, uh, because people talk about explaining quantum mechanics. Well, what that means is finding a theory that isn't quantum mechanics, from which quantum mechanics would emerge as some approximation. Now, this will probably happen someday, but we're very, very far from it, um, uh, because quantum mechanics is so good. I mean, we haven't found any experiment that violates it. You know, we can imagine them black hole, it might, uh, it would probably go wrong or have to be combined in some way with relativity. We don't know what it is, but there's no experiment that's been done uh, uh, that's, uh, that, will, that will guide us into what this underlying theory would be that would explain quantum physics. It's very different from the situation with quantum mechanics itself, because that grew in the 1900s, 10s and 20s in lockstep with lots of experiments on the spectra of atoms and molecules, and each, gui each guiding the other, and in the end, quantum mechanics explained 
classical mechanics, where it comes from, and some limit of, uh, of, of Newtonian. So but we're nowhere near that now. So when people talk about explaining or interpreting, that's what they really mean. Because otherwise, they're referring to different pictures, very valuable. The mathematics is intricate, and there are different ways of looking at it. Uh, each of, and they seem very different, but they're all equivalent. And these different pictures are useful in uh, different ways in solving different problems. I would put it in this way. We physicists are promiscuous with our themata. We'll take any idea that is, gives you a picture that enables you to do something. So, so, but none of those, in any way, if I dare to use the word, gives, is the real or the true uh, way of looking at quantum mechanics. So the answer is, we, don't, we can't explain quantum mechanics. Just as, it's the same problem that happened in Newtonian mechanics. You know, uh, when Newton uh, invented uh, uh, mechanics, people could ask, why do the paths of particles depend on a second-order differential equation? Where did that come from? You know, and then, of course, we all know action at a distance. He, 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 the, uh, could, couldn't explain that. Now we know from Einstein it's a curvature of space in between. But at that time, classical mechanics was completely ununderstood. So this question, at any stage, the most, the deepest theories, you just have to state them. And of course, they arrived at with tremendous insight and they work, uh, but you can't explain them. It's the child asking why and why and why. Very sensible questions, but you reach a point, you say, we don't know. This is one yeah. of the uh, Since you're from England, which is the home of cricket, Slightly tangential question. So is there any interesting uh, use cases or uh, applications of quantum physics in cricket? Like, uh, uh, for example, they use this uh, ultra edge to detect uh, edges and snakes. And I couldn't actually understand you. Can somebody can say what was said? Because I, I don't have very... I, I, you maybe spoke too close or I don't hear too well. So applications of quantum yeah. physics in cricket. In cricket? Yeah. yeah. I doubt it. <laughs> I mean, you, 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 you can ask this question. I mean, in the days of chaos theory, uh, the, 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 you, you have this notion that uh, collisions of complex bodies, thinking of billiards, not cricket, allow me to change your question, uh, 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 pinball machines are unpredictable, unlike the swinging of a pendulum, which is predictable. So then the question is, um, well, why is it unpredictable? What is it determines? And one calculation, if you take... Um, if you take uh, 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 molecules in a gas, and wh why are they unpredictable? What is it uh, that makes it uh, un unpredictable? Well, one, you think of the atoms in a box, uh, insulated from the outside world, but you can't insulate gravity. And even an electron at the observable limit of the universe, but you don't know where it is, you don't measure it, will render the collisions uncertain. You come out of a bounce and you're wrong by 90 degrees, after about 30 or 40 collisions. Now, with uh, billiards on a billiard table, quantum mechanics comes in, and it's about 10 or 12 collisions. Already, your gravity around the table is seven or eight collisions, would render it uncertain. So you can think about when quantum uncertainty comes in, and uh, you know, in those examples, it's not the dominant source of the uncertainty. But in other examples, it might be. With cricket, I doubt it. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Zyglinde, and uh, my question is, can you pull out your crystal ball and uh, share some of the technologies that you feel are going to advance science next? You, 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 sorry, I, I, the last part I didn't understand. I've got to advance... Te technology, so science advances technology, Yes. Right? And then technology advances science. Yeah. So which technologies do you see now recently that you think are going to push science? Oh, forward? quantum information, I'm sure. I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure that, you know, we don't know how it's... I mean, at the moment, I'm disappointed by quantum information theory. It's obviously leading to extremely deep concepts, entanglement and uh, purification, and uh, many, many concepts are, are coming in. But the only application, I'm unhappy about it, is to the keeping of secrets, is quantum cryptography. Now, of course, I don't want people to hack into my bank account, and you have to keep military... Um, uh, uh, information secret, but it's a kind of miserable negative thing. It's not life enhancing. Now we await a life enhancing application uh, of, of, of the technology that's developing 
we, we will be totally surprised when we find what it is. We don't know what it is. That will be a sort of world-changing, in the unpleasant terminology that industry is the killer application. We, we, we don't know what it will be. Uh, but once it's found, it will certainly feed back and help us do science. But you can't predict. You're asking me, I don't have a crystal ball. You know, I do actually have a crystal ball, but I'm not it, it, use it in optics, but not to predict things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have a quartz quart sphere. So two from there. Uh, professor, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is on, on, on a plot you showed by, from a paper by Max Bond. Yes. Which you said was similar to one of your plots. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't get what that was about. Could you no, I, di I didn't tell you either. All I said was he was studying the stability of uh, bent elastic wires. And these, uh, these uh, lines represent trajectories uh, of uh, what happens if you bend the wire uh, with different initial conditions and to different degrees. And when you bend a wire, it can suddenly snap from one, uh, from, it can snap suddenly from one uh, uh, configuration to another. And those curves, that are in, those curves that are enveloped by the lines on the picture, they represent curves, when you cross them, you'll get a sudden change of stability. So it's to do with that. Yeah. Got the one. Hi, uh, thank you for that. It's a Thank you for that wonderful talk. I have one question regarding one of your plots uh, on quantum revival slides. You had shown me a plot of uh, a wave packet interfering with itself yes. in a one-dimensional box. Um, if I'm correct, I thought maybe a, uh, there should be a leakage of the wave packet outside the box. Why was that not shown or is it... Because oh, I'm thinking, because, uh, you know, look, okay, fine. The good, good question because in physics, in any application, any modeling, you idealize. Of course you do, you don't take the whole world. In this idealization, the walls are infinitely hard. Right, so nothing leaks out. It's still a hard problem. And all the things I showed you, that very rich quantum carpet, is within that uh, idealization. It, of course, st still there if you de-idealize, but that just gives complication without insight. So uh, it's nothing to do with leaking. Uh, that, co that complicated, which is actually a fractal pattern, I didn't discuss that, um, is, uh, is a consequence of, uh, of just in that idealized model. When you learn as a student, as a, a particle in the box, you learn about its individual energy levels. And they're very easy to solve or understand. They're just sines and cosines. And all. But if instead you ask a different question, how does a packet evolve in time, which involves all of those states in the superposition, then you get this richness with the Gauss sums and the quantum carpets and so on. Thank you. Yeah. The last question from here. Hello, Professor. Uh, here is a very, um, as you said, we can ask stupid questions. So I think this question is stupid, but still I'll ask you. Uh, you, uh, you talked all about interconnectedness today. So yes. what is the interconnectedness between physics and philosophy? Second part, are all theoretical physicists essentially philosophers? And third, is there an interconnectedness between uh, physics, philosophy, and spirituality? Not stupid. Not a, first of all, not a question. Several questions. <laughs> secondly, <laughs> secondly, not stupid questions. Okay, now I recently wrote the foreword to a book taking up and developing those ideas that uh, I described on the relation between theories at different levels and singular limits. And in there I said that Newton's third law does not apply to physics and philosophy. They study what we do, we don't study what they do. <laughs> okay, that's fine, because their subject is different. Our subject is uh, uh, the physical world and how we can interact with it, and their subject is what is our understanding? What does it mean to know something, and etc. Of course, physicists could be more or less reflective, and some physicists have a philosophical turn of mind, I to some extent do, uh, without being a professional philosopher, uh, and many don't, who go through their whole... Feynman, uh, he said, uh, physicists need philosophy like birds need ornithologists. <laughs> you know, well, okay. Uh, so and that, that's just fun. I mean, you, you know, he, when his son, was, his son is a computer scientist, but when his son was growing up, Feynman said, I don't want to guide you in any way at all. You can study anything you like. But he was bitterly disappointed when his son chose to study philosophy. The one subject that he didn't respect. Uh, never mind. And, uh, and I don't take that view. I enjoy conversations with philosophers. Now, so, so, now, 
So now our, our physicists, philosophers, some maybe, some not maybe, some not, but that's largely irrelevant to whether what they practice is good or bad, or deep or not deep. So it's almost, it's kind of disappointing to philosophers to hear this, but they, they shouldn't be disappointed because their aim is something different. I mean, it's not quite, they don't want to understand rainbows and, uh, and, 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 and uh, magic, oriental magic mirrors and the like. It's, different, it's below their radar. Uh, as to spirituality, I'm sorry, I don't know what that means. You know, uh, my brother is a man of religion and he's a rabbi and he tells me, and I'm not religious at all, I tell him I'm a confirmed atheist, but he tells me, no, no, I'm a very spiritual per he talking about me because I'm interested in these deep connections of the world and so, well, I leave that discussion to him. We're very, we are very good friends. <laughs> so, thank you, Professor Berry, for a wonderful talk. So, before we discuss, I have just one announcement. The next Kapi talk is on 22nd July and it will be delivered by Alexander Babenko. It's on the discrete charm of geometry, something which we connect here. So do mark your calendars and do come up. Please join us for coffee now.